Why does this place exist? Why is it so special? Las Vegas is in the middle of the Mojave Desert, one of the driest places on earth. And only 120 years ago, this place was little more than a desert outpost. On my quest to find the truth, I learned something fascinating. The city was built through sheer human willpower, building something from nothing in the desert. They were legitimate business tycoons, notorious mobsters, but all ultimately dreamers and risk takers. They set out to build a city in the middle of the desert. They had no experience, no permission, but they had a vision of a city that would be known throughout the world. Las Vegas, Las Vegas and Vegas. And against all odds, they succeeded. This is the story of the visionaries that built Las Vegas. At the turn of the 20th century, only 25 people lived in what then resembled an encampment. It was the Wild West. It brought people a fresh start and for others, a second or even third chance at life. So in 1855, the Mormons built a fort in what would later become Las Vegas. It provided a rest stop for travelers between Salt Lake City and Los Angeles. And Las Vegas could have remained an insignificant pit stop had it not been for one man, his name was William Andrews Clark. Like the Mormons before him, this U.S. Senator and mining baron from Montana recognized the strategic importance of Las Vegas. Although Las Vegas is located in the middle of the arid Mojave Desert, there is one thing that makes Las Vegas unique in the region, its access to water. Snowmelt from surrounding mountains and natural springs from aquifers make Las Vegas a natural oasis in the desert. More importantly for Clark, the water in Las Vegas supported his railroads that ran from Salt Lake City to Los Angeles. It provided enough water to fill the massive 25,000 gallon water tanks of his steam locomotive trains. Yeah, they were massive. So in 1902, Clark bought 1,800 acres of the Las Vegas Valley with water rights for only $55,000. And only three years later, Clark would subdivide 110 acres into lots for sale. When all was said and done, Clark sold half the lots for $265,000 at auction. Just like that, downtown Las Vegas was born. Let me ask you something. Did you miss something? There's a piece of history here that's not really well covered. The railroads and the people that built them weren't just in the transportation business. They were in the city building business. By selling those lots, William Andrews Clark multiplied his initial investment on a per acre basis by 150 times. The remaining thousand plus acres that weren't sold would later become even more valuable as the city boomed in future years. In other words, William Andrews Clark became an even richer man, not from his railroad, but from his startup that is the city of Las Vegas. And by 1930, the city had grown to just over 5,000 from only 25 people 30 years earlier. But it would take a world war and the building of the tallest dam at the time before Las Vegas would enter its infamous casino era. But even then, we could see glimpses into what would later become modern Las Vegas. From its roots in the Wild West, Las Vegas had been a male-dominated place, with most working on the railroads early on. But stuck in the middle of nowhere with not much to do, a lot of the guys relaxed by drinking, gambling, and visiting whorehouses in the popular red light district called Block 16. And this trend would obviously continue for Sin City through the 1950s and beyond. And now you can see sex workers walk up and down the halls of the Encore past midnight. But that story is for another time. The Great Depression starting in 1929 should have meant disaster for Las Vegas. But its fortune couldn't be further from what you'd expect. The nearby construction of the Hoover Dam in the 1930s created a boom for Las Vegas. The project employed 21,000 men, and after a hard day's work, Block 16 in Las Vegas was the go-to place to relax. The city grew. World War II shortly thereafter would bring an additional boom. The war drove the mining industry, the construction of military bases, and even brought testing of atomic bombs nearby. By 1950, the population of Las Vegas would nearly 5x within 20 years to 25,000 people. The city's future looked bright, but it was still tiny compared to places like Los Angeles that were 80 times larger. 
it would take the legalization of gambling in Nevada in 1931 and the arrival of a crazy motherfucker named Bugsy Siegel in the late 1930s to propel Las Vegas to the iconic city that it is today. Like William Clark and his railroad, he was also a pioneer. He popularized the world of casinos in Las Vegas. The seed he planted eventually grew into modern Las Vegas, but it would later end up costing him his life. They called him Bugsy. Back in the day, it was slang for crazy. His temper was quick and violent. He was the type of guy you never wanted to cross. A gunslinger first to shoot. He was a man of action, a real cowboy. Circumstance would eventually bring Bugsy to the West Coast in 1937. He made some enemies along the way and was relocated by the Mafia for his own good. Las Vegas was a fresh start for Bugsy, a literal second chance at life. He was determined to make the most out of it. And if he did it right, he would inadvertently change the course of Las Vegas's history forever. Now finding himself on the west coast, Siegel dabbled in gambling rackets, the drug trade, and sex trade. But he always knew that the big bucks were in running the casinos. The first resort casino, El Rancho Vegas, opened on the Las Vegas Strip in 1941. Their extraordinary success demonstrated to Bugsy that the resort-style casino was the future. To him, it was a slam dunk. The completion of highways and airports in the 1940s would drive more visitors to Las Vegas. Not only that, the casino resort resorts would provide a fresh experience. It would attract big spenders from California seeking to unwind for the weekend. I mean, similar to how it is today. They even made a movie about it. They've made countless movies about it. And it's no surprise, you go to Vegas and you have beautiful hotel rooms, gourmet meals, live entertainment, and anything you could ever wish for. It all provided an unparalleled experience. And who knew better than the mobsters themselves to run a successful casino? They'd been running gambling rackets for decades. Maybe not not the most legal, but still, they had run gambling businesses. They had experience. They had that operational expertise that couldn't be replicated by just anyone. They also had the financial resources to shape the future of Las Vegas. However, Bugsy would have to wait for the right opportunity. In 1945, Bugsy bought El Cortez Casino in downtown Las Vegas, but this would be short-lived. Bugsy was forced to sell only six months later after Las Vegas City gaming officials made it near impossible to run his business. Business. Fortunately for Bugsy, there were other more attractive opportunities nearby. Funny enough, the Las Vegas Strip, where most of the large casinos are located today, are actually not within the city limits of Las Vegas. They're located in the unincorporated towns of Paradise and Winchester. This technicality made it easier for mobsters to operate outside the jurisdiction of Las Vegas gaming officials. So in 1946, Bugsy finally opened the iconic Flamingo Casino and Resort on the Las Vegas Vegas Strip. Although the build-out was over budget and lost money early on, the Flamingo was eventually a success. More importantly, this success served as a model that could be replicated on the Las Vegas Strip by mobsters all across the country. Think McDonald's, but casinos run by some pretty rough dudes. But Bugsy would never live to see the future of Las Vegas. This visionary's life would be cut short at the tender age of 41. On the night of June 20th, 1947, only six months after the Flamingo opened for business, nine gunshots rang out on Linden Drive in Beverly Hills. Glass shattered everywhere as bullets flew through the window of a Beverly Hills mansion, striking down Bugsy while he sat on a couch reading the newspaper. His luck had finally run out. His death remains unresolved to this day, but the popular opinion is that it was gang related. The reason, as with many things in life, it all came down to money. For Bugsy and most American mobsters, building the Flamingo Resort and Casino was the first of its kind. Combined with not having a construction background, Bugsy's detail-oriented personality caused constant remodeling and delays. He just wanted it perfect. He just wanted it perfect. I saw him one time turn all one side out and have him move the pool and tear all the, the back wall out of it. I think he did that back wall three times. 
The cost of the project skyrocketed from an initial estimate of $1.5 million to over $6 million. The over budget build out and poor initial performance of the Flamingo convinced the mob that Bugsy had been stealing from them. And who knows, this may have actually been the case, but still, new management was needed in the mob's eyes and Bugsy had to go. Details around his death are still hazy, but one thing is certain, his initial insight into the casino resort business model laid the foundation for the modern Las Vegas Strip. Before venture capitalists in Silicon Valley, there were mobsters in the Mojave Desert ready to seed startup casinos. Today, the Wynn Group, VC Properties, and Private Equity own the Las Vegas Strip. The access to capital is not what it was back then. Today, you can finance billion dollar properties through investment banks like Goldman Sachs. But early on, the mobsters of the Las Vegas casinos were either independently wealthy or connected to the mob. The gaming industry had not yet fully matured and many conservative banks avoided financing casinos altogether and forget about it if you were part of the mob trying to get a loan from any legitimate bank the mob itself needed a banker his name was Jimmy Hoffa. In 1957, he became the president of the Teamsters Labor Union. You might be wondering, how did a labor union leader build the Las Vegas Strip? Two words, pension fund. You see, through Teamsters, Hoffa controlled the central state's pension fund that accumulated $10 million a year from its members. They needed somewhere to put the money and the mob controlled Hoffa by influencing the workers that helped him get elected in the first place. The mob literally built Las Vegas through million dollars no question asked loans from the Teamsters. In the 1950s, the mob replicated the success of the Flamingo by opening the Sands, Dunes, Riviera, Tropicana, and Stardust. And by 1960, total gaming revenue reached more than $200 million annually in the state of Nevada. The mob's casinos were so successful that it started to attract the attention of others. This time, it attracted legitimate business people. The mob built Las Vegas, but as with many businesses in America, if you live long enough, you get to see Wall Street and corporations replace you. The mob continued to expand in the 1960s by building Caesar's Palace in 1966 and Circus Circus in 1968, but the writing was on the wall. Their days in Las Vegas were limited. The mob's rise in the Strip coincided with the crackdown of state gaming regulators, and in 1960, the state of Nevada created their Black Book. Mobsters listed in that book were banned from setting foot in casinos. And months later, Attorney General Bobby Kennedy went after the mob's precious casinos. One of the biggest businesses in America has many faces. Some are well known, like that of the gambler, operating the roulette wheel, which is not only illegal, but fixed. Nothing came out of it, but the wheels were set in motion. Not only that, their funding source from the Teamsters were now also being investigated by the feds. The outlook for the mob continued to get worse. By 1969, Nevada passed laws making it easier for corporations to own casinos. More troubling for the mob was the RICO Act, passed by Congress a year later. This equipped the Justice Department with the legal tools to bring down entire criminal enterprises once and for all in the United States. By 1970, Las Vegas was no longer just any city. It had a population over 125,000. And by 1975, gaming revenue in the state of Nevada had topped $1 billion. Gaming became the most important sector of the economy for not just Las Vegas, but the entire state of Nevada. Gaming paid for half of the Nevada state budget in 1975. Of course, investors in Wall Street would begin to notice. They always do when there's money to be made. But before they did, it would take a legitimate businessman to change the perception of Las Vegas and make it business friendly again. Eccentric billionaire Howard Hughes had begun to build his own portfolio of casinos in the 1960s. In a course of only one year, he bought one third of the Las Vegas Strip for $65 million. But Howard Hughes wasn't the typical Wall Street type. He was born on December 24, 1905 in Houston, Texas to a family of inventors and business owners. He grew up lucky. At the young age of 19, he inherited his father's tools business. 
but it wasn't just any tools business. It owned the patent for the Rotary Tricone rock bit, which was essential for the oil drilling business. And when the Texas oil boom hit in the early 20th century, millions started flowing in. It would fund his ventures as a Hollywood film producer and director. It also funded his acquisition of the third largest airline TWA. So you might be thinking, what does the Las Vegas Strip have to do with Howard Hughes? Well, with many that come to Las Vegas, it really came down to chance and circumstance. Like drifters in the Wild West that came before him, Howard Hughes needed a place to rest. He'd been forced out of TWA management in 1960, and he found himself quickly buried under countless lawsuits from his enemies. By 1966, he had sold his stake in TWA for $547 million. So with a lot of money in his pocket, of course he would go to Vegas, but not for the reasons you might think. In the desert, among the endless dunes, you can reinvent yourself. You can have that second chance at life. So in the cover of night on Thanksgiving day, in 1966, Howard Hughes arrived in Las Vegas by private train. He booked the top two floors of the Desert Inn, not knowing then that it would be his home for the next four years. Only one problem. The mobsters wanted him out. He would booked his stay for only 10 days, but when checkout time came, Hughes didn't move. The mob owners of the Desert Inn were furious. The suites had already been promised to high rollers for New Year's. It was one of the busiest holidays. And Hughes never intended to buy the hotel. He just wanted a place to sleep. So on March 27th, 1967, he told them this. I'm going to make him an offer again with Hughes. Hughes paid $13.2 million for the Desert Inn. Hughes was now a proud homeowner. And if you want to be a homeowner yourself, I've covered this extensively in my deep dive video on the key drivers of home prices, including spot on predictions that are already playing out today in the market. So check it out if you want to learn more about the real estate market. Back to the story. This was only the beginning. He would buy five more Las Vegas casinos in that same year, in addition to having a place to sleep. In fact, the whole building to sleep in. His investments provided favorable tax benefits and a place to park a large amount of capital from his sale of TWA, but he was never truly interested in the casino business. In fact, his Nevada casinos lost around $13 million in a span of four years. His casinos eventually became old and run down. It would take a new breed of investors to revitalize Las Vegas and bring it into the modern world. At 1.27 p.m. on April 5th, 1976, Howard Hughes passed away from kidney failure while flying in a private jet over South Texas. He lived his life as a dreamer, his mind in the clouds. He died the same way. By then, Hughes had already left his mark. Hughes brought to Las Vegas a much needed aura of respectability, glamour, and legitimacy. He would inspire legitimate businessmen to make their own mark in Las Vegas. And it would be Wall Street, not the feds, that would finally force the mob out of the resort casino business in Las Vegas. At the end of the day, the universal truth is this. Money talks. And the mobsters had always been a liability. The only reason the city had put up with them is because initially they provided the critical financing that the city needed to build the Las Vegas Strip. The mob built Las Vegas, that's for sure. But when the corporations from Wall Street started moving in, Las Vegas no longer needed the mob. By the mid 70s, Nevada gambling officials began scrutinizing and refusing license applications of known mobsters. And by the mid 80s, as we all know, this happened. The corporate era had arrived. The mobsters had been replaced by Kirk Kerkorian and Steve Wynn. And in this era, Kirk Kerkorian completed the International Hotel in July 1969. It was the largest hotel in the country at the time. At a cost of $80 million, it was four times the cost of mob-run Caesars Palace. The mob simply couldn't compete against the vast sums of cash that the Wall Street engines could raise. Over the next two years, Kirk would bring the publicly owned conglomerate into the casino business in Las Vegas. Between 1970 and 1971, he would sell the International and Flamingo Hotels to Hilton. Soon, other corporations would follow. Over the next two decades, corporations would continue to purchase strip resorts until 1989. On a sunny Wednesday afternoon on November 22nd, 1989, Steve Wynn would finally open the Mirage. But he wasn't the only person to help build it. As we saw with the mobsters, behind every great business 
man, I'll show you his banker. In the late 1970s, the creation of the junk bond by investment banker Michael Milken of Drexel Burnham Lambert enabled Steve to build any casino he would ever want. He would leverage this new financial instrument to bring Las Vegas to new heights that mobsters could never even have imagined. And get this, he raised $535 million from junk bonds. This would fund the construction of the Mirage Mega Resort and Casino for a record $630 million. It became the largest hotel and casino on the Strip, twice as large as the MGM Grand built 16 years earlier. And to this day, its 54-foot volcano erupts every half hour after dark. The mega resort era is where we find ourselves today. Las Vegas is expected to draw nearly 38 million visitors this year, and its hot housing market now supports close to 650,000 residents in Las Vegas. The mega resorts transformed Las Vegas to the vacation resort city that Bugsy Siegel envisioned 40 years earlier. By the 1990s, the revenue earned from the resort's business surpassed revenue from gambling. Since then, we have seen the build out of iconic mega resorts that still draw millions of people today. I'm talking about the new MGM Grand, Luxor, Bellagio, Venetian, Paris, Wynn, and Encore. And of course, I wouldn't leave out Resorts World off that list. Resorts World opened for business on June 24th, 2021. No expense was spared. It is the most expensive casino and resort ever developed in Las Vegas, costing a mind-boggling $4.3 billion. Las Vegas has come a long way from its roots as a small desert outpost in the Wild West. And to a large extent, the colorful figures looking for a fresh start have been replaced by suits seeking to manufacture good times for its visitors. In a sense, it's kind of unfortunate. You can visit a nice resort anywhere in the world. There's nothing that Las Vegas provides that can't be offered by other places. But as Lady Las Vegas has tore down and rebuilt itself many times over in its brief history, I feel like something's been lost. Something real, something human. This feeling is best represented by a seemingly random parking lot in Las Vegas between 1st and 2nd and Ogden and Stewart. Before this parking lot was paved over, it was better known as Block 16. Remember that place? It was the go-to place for your everyday person on Main Street to relax after working all day on the railroads, the Hoover Dam, and the war factories during World War II. Las Vegas used to be the place you would go for a fresh start or a second chance at life, but even that might be changing. Rising prices and stagnating wages make it harder and harder to live in Las Vegas. The median sell price for a home in Las Vegas is now $450,000. That's more than three times what it was only 10 years ago. As for the city itself, Las Vegas continues to bounce back post-pandemic. Its recovery will now depend on rebounding international travel and business travel that's attracted to its conventions and trade shows it hosts each year. It will continue to be a destination, don't get me wrong. It will continue to attract millions of visitors to its vacation resorts, but longer term, I'm not so sure. The new generation generation wants real experiences, not superficial corporate manufactured ones. I hope you enjoyed this video exploring the lives of those that built Las Vegas and made the impossible possible through grit, unyielding determination, and a bit of luck. And if you're watching this video right now, thanks for watching, smash the like button, hit the subscribe button while you're at it, and I'll see you on the next one, Wolfpack.